going to go ahead and get started. All right. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. I want to remind you that we have the Community Partnership Series uh, every second Tuesday of the month at 530. Next month is Pickering Creek. We have the uh, Avalon. Uh, we have hospice. We are booked through June or July, I believe, at this point. So we're picking up steam. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, visit with Robbie Gill of the YMCA in January. Uh, uh, this month, we'll be turning it over to the Chesapeake Maritime uh, Museum. I'd like Mr. Tillman uh, to introduce our speaker this evening, Ms. Greenaway. Uh, Mr. Tillman, take it away. Thank you, Rob. It's a real pleasure to be able to appear before you by uh, Zoom to welcome Kristen Greenaway, uh, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. By way of introduction, let me give a little quick background on Kristen. In case you don't already know, Kristen is a native New Zealander. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the university there, and also has a master's degree from Duke University. Kristen grew up on the water and has sailed virtually all of her life. As a child, she and her family lived on a 32-foot sailboat that her father built. In 1989, she was a member of an all-woman crew that sailed in the inaugural two months Auckland to Japan yacht race. I can't imagine anybody doing that. Her career is impressive, remarkably varied, and marked by numerous positions of ever increasing responsibility. Let me mention just a few. First, she was the national marketing director for Coopers and Librand in New Zealand and then became head of financial services marketing for Coopers in London. She was director of development for one of the colleges at Cambridge University. She was deputy director of development at the University of London, which university centered in New York in 1997 to establish a North American development office. Later, she was director of the Career Management Center in Rotterdam for Erasmus University's International MBA program. In 2000, Kristen moved to San Diego with her wife, who is a native. She was, became di executive director of the San Diego Sea to Sea Trail, and then became director of events and communications for the Sally Ride Science Center. Five years later, Kristen and her family moved to Durham, North Carolina, where she became Director of Development for Sigma Xi's International Research Center. In 2008, she was appointed Director of Development for the Nasher, Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University. Six years later, the Maritime Museum was conducting a national search for a new president CEO. Kristen applied. She was by far the most qualified candidate in every sense of the word. And on July 14, 2014, Kristen became the museum's new head. To say that she hit the ground running would be a gross understatement. Let me just highlight a few of Kristen's many accomplishments since she's been our CEO. We've had budget surpluses in every single year, and in no way were those results of deferring maintenance or other expenses. She spearheaded development of a five-year strategic plan to focus on developing new audiences, increasing the use of technology, and ensuring long-term financial stability for the institution. The museum has raised more than $16 million under her leadership in the past four years. She was responsible for creation of a 20-year master plan 
for creation of a new look campus, the first construction phase of which is due to begin any day now. She obtained a $5 million contract from the state of Maryland to build a reproduction of the 17th century ship Maryland Dove, a project that is now well underway. She enabled the museum's shipbuilding apprentice program become fully accredited by the state of Maryland. She led the establishment of our Rising Tide program, which introduces at-risk youth to boats and teaches them the basics of shipbuilding. When COVID forced the museum to close its gates, Kristen led her staff in quickly pivoting to virtual programming, thereby enabling us to continue to fulfill our mission. She initiated a focused diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility effort in the wake of the unfortunate events of last spring. This initiative has, is now a board level committee. Hopefully you can now understand what a dynamic leader Kristen is and why all involved at CBMM are committed to ensuring that the museum remains at the forefront of our Eastern Shore community. And now, Kristen. Thank you, Richard, that's very kind. Uh, I also, before I start, want to commend the fact that I have the most incredible team at the museum. We have over 50 staff and the most incredible board. So I can't take all the credit on my own. I may chivy, but uh, it takes a, a good number of people to ensure that we get the, that we have success. All right. <clears throat> all right, I hope that's good for everybody. And uh, the tone level, volume level is good as well. Please, I've got room at the end for any questions, but uh, I am a great interrupter myself. And I certainly do not mind if anyone else would like to follow in my footsteps and interrupt me at any time with any questions whatsoever. Uh, more than happy to take them. So today I wanted to talk uh, about today at CBMM, what we're doing at the museum at this time. This has been, the last year was uh, quite different from anything that uh, we've certainly experienced at the museum and I know you all have too. Uh, and then I'd love to talk a little bit about how you can get involved at the museum and then of course any time for questions. I, I love this photograph. This was taken not that long ago when the New York Yacht Club held one of its uh, uh, rendezvous at the museum. Uh, and you can see some pretty <laughs> impressive ve uh, vehicles, pretty impressive vessels there, and not just the museums as well. So a quick reminder for everybody on our, on our mission, uh, dedicated to the Chesapeake Bay uh, in that regard. And uh, we have uh, values, vision, and goals. But the vision, I feel, is very important as well. We wish to be transformative. And a key element, which I have very much stressed in my first six and a half years, is that we must be a vital community partner. That has been our goal right from the start when I arrived. Uh, and I take great, great pride in, in, uh, in stating that that is that is something that we have worked very hard to achieve over these last years. So a little bit of background. Uh, when we closed in mid-March, overnight on the 14th, uh, the museum faced a really pivotal turning point. We had invested so heavily over the last, the previous five years in engaging in-person uh, activities on, on our beautiful campus. Uh, and that has been a key focus that we had undertaken. So with all these new limitations that came about with regard to the closure, the team, the staff, absolutely phenomenally and really overnight, uh, very much definitely shifted into creating every aspect of our program and creating a virtual component to that to be able to connect with our audiences. Uh, we came together, we looked at how we could revolutionize our programs in this respect, uh, and we adopted new tools and established best practices. 
And our mantra in very many respects is we have to get through this current fiscal year. You'll see at the bottom there, our fiscal year ends uh, at the end of February, end of next month. We have to be able to get through this, this fiscal year to survive, to be able to set us up for success for next year. And we fully appreciated that we would prob probably never be the same museum again. And what was very, very exciting is that all staff and the boards fully embraced that concept that this was a time for real change and we had to take advantage of this situation that we're in, even though it was a pretty ghastly situation. Uh, but I, I feel most importantly, you know, we've worked so strategically to make sure this is not just a temporary shift because of these present circumstances. We're leveraging all the work that we have achieved over the last 10 months or so, related that back to our strategic plan and made uh, changes where necessary, uh, reaching new audiences and targeting and integrating technology into that end-to-end -end guest experience. So we really, at the end of this, we are already a new museum. Uh, just a few little facts here. We faced a nearly $5 million budget and we faced immediately a $1.73 million loss uh, through various uh, earned revenue and visitation, of course, in that regard. We were able to reopen the shipyard in June. We have a contract with the state of Maryland. Our client is Historic City of St. Mary's, a $5 million contract, and we've got a, we've got a big ship to build, and I'll, I'll show some photos of that a little bit later. And on July 29th, we were able to reopen uh, campus to the public. We have followed every CDC guideline, the state of Maryland. We worked very cl closely with uh, Dr. Wadley at that time uh, in ensuring that all our actions in reopening were focused on the health and safety of the staff and of course our visitors. Uh, the pandemic has hit us hard. Last fiscal year, we had 80,000 visitors on campus, which is a record for us. Uh, at the moment, we've had at this fiscal year, no festivals whatsoever. Typically, our festivals are 40,000 people. Non-festival attendance at this time is 43% of that. So we've had just under 20,000 visitors uh, to date to the museum, which considering we've only been open for those few months, we're actually very proud of that. And continuing uh, in the six and a half years since I've been there, been here, we will end this fiscal year in the black. And that is a huge shout out again to the staff and to the board and our supporters who have believed in us and have really supported us both, both uh, psychologically, uh, enthusiasm and financially as well. We could not have done this without them in that regard. So from an education perspective, uh, of course, we canceled everything in that regard. And, but we quickly reimagined the entire school program that we had. And we worked very closely with all the school districts, all local cultural institutions, to reimagine what we could do for people in that regard. We put together a, a, a very good slate of immer uh, immersive synchronous field trip programs. Uh, and we supported that with all the uh, backup materials that we have that we were able to transfer online so teachers could use all that material, lessons plans, uh, videos, they could transfer that to the classroom as well. And our very successful bus scholarship program, which has been now funded the last couple of years by the most wonderful Betty McKenzie, was transferred. There were no buses, of course, but with Betty's permission, we were able to transfer that funding uh, to be able to provide support for these classrooms to be able to fulfill the virtual programming in that regard. Uh, and then we had a number of free student webinars throughout out the year, so we did not leave our we did not leave our students <clears throat> uh, and teachers high and dry. We've, we also offered small pod uh, on campus classes for homeschoolers, uh, families, youth organizations, uh, and that has been very successful as well and that's given uh, students an opportunity to be up close and personal with the, with the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, I think that you know, the key thing is here that everything we've done can be backed up with resources to go back into the classrooms. And a lot of the support for this as well has come from Jim and Pam Harris uh, a couple of years ago. They gave us a very, very meaningful gift 
And this has us, enabled us to be able to uh, pivot and be effective so readily because of, uh, because of that support in that regard. Thank you, Jim. Uh, rising Tide, which Richard mentioned, this is one of my, my key babies, so to speak. Uh, you've probably heard me talk about Rising Tide, our after school building program for many years yeah. now. And uh, so we knew that we had students in our program, sixth through ninth grade, and we've got uh, older children as well, older youth in that, in, that, uh, in that format. And we knew that we cannot leave them high and dry. A lot of them were, all the public school children were caught at home. Uh, and we immediately resumed all our classes in a virtual format in that regard. And for the very first time, we had students from outside the state. It was, it was absolutely fantastic that we had all these, the, a number of students who found out about us. So we made a move from all those large, big in-person building projects uh, to those um, shorter projects. And we were able to, it, it, I think one of the stories I really love is we were able to help children tidy up their rooms. I think their parents are very glad. A lot of them were joining us virtually in their bedrooms and we gave them the encouragement to be able to tidy them up so they could have some pride in their background when they were working on their, in their uh, Rising Tide programs. But, uh, but one of the key, one of the key aspects uh, that we had uh, once we able to start bringing students back on campus as uh, we started up, they've got their own uh, facility that's dedicated uh, to the programming, but we were able to, particularly as it was a bit warm, we were able to bring back our free fishing on Fridays, uh, which brought a lot of, lot of family members as well. We got a, a blanket uh, permit from MDE, Maryland Department of the Environment Fishing, uh, which we're very grateful for. I'm sorry, that is not my phone. It's actually somebody else's phone is here uh, and we have been able to now to continue to small in-person classes and we did, because of the fact we had all the number of students from outside the state we have absolutely continued the virtual classes because we did not want to leave anybody high and dry in that regard uh, so we're very proud of that too we also did not stop from a curatorial exhibition perspective uh, and we had some terrific supporters in this regard. Our immediate exhibition that we opened just soon after we closed uh, was the Jay Fleming exhibition, which was 100% uh, virtual. Uh, all Jay Fleming's uh, presentations, we had over 100 people at a, two of his presentations uh, virtually. Uh, and then we worked into doing both in-person, in situ and virtual exhibitions. Uh, of course, the water, our annual waterfowl exhibition adds to Whitling Knife that is uh, on view now in the in the waterfowl building, and then the, the absolutely fantastic exhibition in the steamboat building, uh, the photographer Dave Harp's photography, and both of these exhibitions are also online. Uh, particularly Dave Harp, if you get a chance, please take the opportunity to come and see the exhibition in purpose, uh, in, per in person and in purpose in the steamboat building because it is absolutely phenomenal. And one of the really poignant points of this exhibition is that there are nearly 80 uh, photographs that Dave took during the 70s when he was on a skipjack, uh, a fortnight's skipjack uh, experience. And they're all the black uh, watermen working on the skipjacks. And this is, these are images that have never been seen before in public. Uh, and it is an incredibly meaningful experience. So please do come and see that. Also, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the shipyard now. As, as Richard mentioned, a program just over two years ago now, our Shipwright Apprentice program has been uh, functioning for, golly, probably about 15, 18 years now, but it was very much a kind of a, a cheap labor concept, so to speak, a grunt concept. Uh, just over two years ago, we received uh, full accreditation by the state and federal for a full uh, shipwright apprentice program. And just a few months ago, we graduated our very first, this was the Site Family Foundation shipwright apprentice, Zach Harris, uh, and he was the first to graduate in the program. We have four apprentices. We've just taken on two new apprentices. Uh, 
and they, a key element of their work is uh, looking after the floating fleet. Uh, we have 13, 14 vessels in the floating fleet and the big project now uh, that the floating fleet maintenance has been done for the season is the 1912 riv River Tug Delaware. And I do encourage you to come on campus to come and see this as well. There's a couple of photographs here. These, uh, that's Stephen on the right at the bottom there, one of our apprentices uh, working on Delaware. They're taking out every other plank. Uh, and the head of the floating fleet program is Michael Allen just on the left there. So this is a real sight to behold. Uh, and this is a absolute complete restoration of this. Uh, the, it's the last of two uh, vessels that were built in Delaware, in Bethel, Delaware, this one, De uh, this, the River Tug, and, uh, and the, the big one that's on the uh, main coin, uh, the uh, Chesapeake Ram, which Maine tends to think it's theirs, but it's not really. Uh, victory chimes. And of course, the major project that we've got going on now is Maryland Dove. And I wanted to share a few photographs with you. These I took these just the other day. Uh, I try and get back to campus as often as possible. But since May 13th, I have been working from home. March 13th, I've been working from home. And uh, many of us, as many of our staff are. So the, the progression the, of the ship is absolutely incredible. Uh, as you can see, we've got we're we're well on the way. Uh, here's a great shot of the of the transom uh, and the keel. One of the really exciting things about this is that there's there's very little of the ship we're actually building that we're not building. The keel is lit, poured in Canada. The sails are being made by a a woman up in Maine, but everything else, the bolts. Uh, and not the engines, of course, but uh, the bolts, the everything, uh, the rigging, the actual, all the physical rigging, everything we are doing in-house. Uh, we have our own foundry. We have all the ability to be able to do this ourselves. And here's a shot just as, again, took just a couple of days ago. This is interior. Uh, and I hope somebody figures out how we can get that table bench out of there before we close it all up. I'm sure they've got plans for that. But uh, as you can see, this is quite an undertaking uh, and it is something that we are very, very proud of in this regard. Uh, as soon as the hull is complete, uh, we are going to crane the vessel and so it floats. We're going to crane the vessel into the water and we will complete the interior uh, and the rigging while it's in the water on the side of the dock, which would be quite exciting. Mm -hmm. So. I'd love now to talk with you <clears throat> about how you can get involved with the museum. And there's quite a few ways to do this. Number one, of course, is our programming. And just starting next month, early next month, is our 2021 Winter Speaker Series. Uh, you can find, uh, I'm sure that the uh, Country Club will share this, uh, if they will share this P, uh, PowerPoint with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you can click on all these uh, on all these underlying uh, abilities uh, links URL links to to get you there, but uh, they'll also be found in the latest copy of the Chesapeake Log, and you can find these online as well. But you'll see that we've really, with regard to what Richard mentioned, our new DE8, our Diversity, Equality, Inclusiveness, Accessibility Committee, we have made quite an effort to really work far more on the story of everybody who has who lives works and plays and has lived worked and played on the Chesapeake Bay so there are a lot of really challenging and interesting discussions speakers uh, that are go going to be coming up over the next few months so I do encourage you to to really take advantage of these as well and also uh, just a shout out that uh, the Chesapeake Forum has a David Blight lecture coming up very shortly in, in memory of John Ford. Uh, and uh, I do encourage you to take advantage of, of listening to David Blight. Uh, I'm sure Richard Tillman will it'll absolutely back me up that he is one of the most phenomenal speakers uh, and his, his knowledge and his empathy with, uh, with um, Frederick Douglass is, is out of this world. So programming, of course, 
is a key part. And of course, our Apprentice for a Day programming, uh, we again pivoted overnight to make a lot of this virtual. Uh, Jen Kuhn, who's pictured on the right there, she does a fantastic, uh, every once a month now, she does a coffee and wood chips, brings everybody up to speed with what's happening in the shipyard and also gives uh, some element of uh, good in kind of internal knowledge about how to uh, work on uh, certain tools and, uh, and, and, and uh, woodworking. Uh, we are doing a little bit of in-personal, in-person uh, programming just to keep a hand in that respect. Of course, we're all physically, uh, socially distanced, but we are making sure that we continue the programs that we set up uh, over the last uh, five, six years. So this is, there's a lot of fun activities here as well. And of course, volunteering uh, is a key part of who we are. We have over 250 registered volunteers. Uh, and we could not, with over with about 56 staff, 250 volunteers, this is how we do what we do. And we could not achieve what we do without these volunteers. They are an absolutely an integral part of our team. Uh, the, we do have a few in-person volunteer activities at the moment. Uh, a lot of our volunteers, quite wisely, have decided to stay home. Uh, and uh, we do... Uh, we've been quite happy for that to happen. In fact, we've encouraged it in some, with some, in some respects. Uh, but we also do have a number of volunteers who are doing some phenomenal in-person work, uh, not just on campus, but taking materials home and working on that as well. So we've been, uh, we've, we've modified, we've pivoted again there. Uh, but we do have some good assignments uh, on, you know, on the, in the offing, shipyard volunteers, program assistants. We have a new guest uh, host role, which is very important for helping to orientate, uh, orient uh, new um, visitors, new visitors on work. And we have a, a still a large number of volunteer meetings, of course, all virtual, continuing educational opportunities. We have a very, very robust educational program for the volunteers. And uh, we even held our Christmas holiday party virtually this year too. And we had a couple of hundred people on for that, and that was exciting. Uh, so until it's safe to gather again, we will continue. Uh, we are still developing ongoing virtual volunteering opportunities, depending on the situations we find ourselves in. Uh, we're taking part, uh, taking advantage of this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service. Uh, and we're offering opportunities for transcribers for our oral history, oral history collections. If anyone is interested, uh, please let me know. This is very, very important for us to be able to expand these uh, and also alternate text for all our digital images. Uh, this is very, very important work. Uh, and this is, we have to do this. We have to complete this program to be able to make all our resources far more accessible uh, for people of all backgrounds in that regard. Uh, and we also have a number, and I'll be happy to share these links at any time, uh, we have a virtual volunteer fair coming up, uh, which is when you learn all about, we have volunteers who talk about the opportunities in, in, in relation to their own interests. Uh, we have another volunteer orientation meeting coming up very, very shortly. Uh, and we have, uh, we just have a lot of activities going on for our volunteers. We value them. Uh, as I said, they are absolutely integral to our, to our success. Uh, and if you have any interest in that regard, uh, would be so happy to hear from you. And of course, the key part on getting involved, become a member. I've put the link down there at the bottom. Uh, and we would be absolutely thrilled. It gives you free entry uh, at any time. Uh, and it gives you the opportunity to not only support us, but have a phenomenal experience. And we are the best dog walking park. Uh, on the Eastern Shore. You can ask Anne and Frank Mickey about that. And uh, we, and and also it's, I think we're, we're very proud of the fact that even when the museum is closed, the buildings are closed after hours, the museum is still open. Uh, we, we, we feel very strongly that we are a community resource and you can sit under the lighthouse or at the end of a dock at any time and enjoy a sunset or a sunrise. Uh, and that's a key part of it. But come and visit. That's the number one way 
uh, that you can get involved. Come and come and see what's happening in the shipyard and, and cheer our shipwrights on and our shipwright apprentices on uh, and just enjoy the efforts that we've made on our 18 acre campus uh, to make it as welcoming as possible at this time as safe as possible uh, and we just very much appreciate all the support that you've given us over the years. Uh, the museum was founded in 1965 uh, and we have another 50 plus years uh, to go. Uh, my wife would like me to be working that much longer, but uh, I'm not so keen on that idea myself. Yeah, I don't think you want a smelly old uh, corpse lying around, but uh, we have, uh, we're very, very proud of what we've achieved over the last uh, six and a half years. Uh, and we are very, very proud of what we've achieved over this last very, very difficult year. And I would be happy to take any questions at all. And if I may, I'll go back to, I'll stop sharing so we can all see each other. Uh, Kristen, it's Craig. I, uh, a comment and a question. First of all, um, you know, as we all begin to slowly, slowly and safely break out of this, uh, situation we've been in, uh, I can just attest to the fact that Diane and I had a couple of friends who were sort of in the bubble uh, here in uh, East looking for something to do and, and going and looking at the Dove. And, and of course, as you well know, uh, the shipbuilders come out and talk to you. Yep. And people were just amazed that they could, you know, stand there not only to behold what was being built, but talk to the people who were building it. It's just a, it's just an amazing experience at a time when, uh, there aren't a lot of things that you can that you can do, and and so I just would say would share the fact that this is a as a great activity, and there's it's interactive, uh, and it's a marvel of, of what's being done there at the museum. It's a once in a lifetime experience. It really is. Yep. My my question is this, and I and I sort of invite you to talk a, a little bit about the um, some of the findings of that economic impact uh, study that was done. <laughs> Because uh, I think well, the point I want to make is that it's so, it really is remarkable the extent to which the museum has has and continues to contribute to the the economy of the community. And as things come back, as people come back, they they, they spend the weekends, they go to the restaurants and that sort of thing. And I I just I just wondered, you know, what your expectation might be as we get into the spring and summer in terms of people coming back to the um, to the museum which will in turn generate uh, economic activity in the community there yeah thank you for that craig i i feel so strongly that the museum is so very very important to the economic uh recovery of of the eastern shore uh and and talbot county st michael's in particular uh, the economic impact and community assessment re uh, report that Craig mentioned, we commissioned that uh, earlier this year. It was based on the previous fiscal years, our best fiscal year ever in terms of visitation, visitation uh, financial success and programming success. And of course, 13 days into the new fiscal year, we closed. Uh, so we didn't have long to be able to celebrate that. But based on those that year, this report, uh, showed that the museum had an economic impact of $11.6 million in Talbot County and $11 million in St. Michael's. And uh, you'll find this report on our, on our website. We're very, very proud of this. Uh, but the, 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 that, and, and if it wasn't for the museum, the numbers of restaurant staff who would not be employed and the number of teachers who would who the the the, the economic impact we give the uh, pays the salaries of of a large number of teachers uh, and the programming with regard to that in public schools, it is something that everybody on the eastern shore should be very proud of, uh, and it's a similar impact of for the entire state of Maryland in that regard. And I remember when I first started, I I had lunch with. Uh, just soon after I started, I had lunch with Governor Hogan, and we just released our very first uh, economic impact report. And, and I mentioned all this to him, and he looked at me and said, I had no idea 
And I said, you wait over the next few years. Uh, and he, every time we see each other, he says, you were right, you were right. So this is, for, for those who are engaged with other non, not-for-profits, this is something that I absolutely harp on about, that every not-for-profit should try and afford to do an economic impact assessment. Because we, where we are a business, we generate uh, tax, we don't pay taxes, but we generate service taxes. And we employ, we employ 55, 56 people. Uh, the, every not-for-profit needs to be recognized as being a huge community and economic driver in their own right. Uh, and I, I, it's, uh, it's, again, something I'm very, very proud of. Uh, the impact that we have and the, impo re the importance we really have uh, to help bring back the, the, these local economies. And that's something that we do not take lightly. Uh, and uh, we, we have these discussions with the St. Michael's Town Commissioners and with the Talbot County uh, uh, as well. And they are firm believers the fact that we all have to be, this is public-private partnership, and we are very, very dedicated toward that in that regard. I hope that that covers that for you, Craig. I get a little bit passionate about this. Yeah, very nicely. And I mean, I really think uh, the museum is able is going to be leading the way back to some of the economic opportunities in the, in the whole region. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Kristen, Kristen hi, it's Jim. Um, Thank you. Would you say a little bit about the marina operations and the advantage oh. of the members about how that all operates? Yes. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we have a phenomenal marina uh, opportunity for members. It's a members only marina, but if you happen to turn up, it's very easy to become a member. Uh, just in that short walk from your vessel to the welcome center to, to be checked in. Uh, the marina, it's funny, when I, 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 I noted at the beginning that we had to cut uh, $1.73 million from our budget and we reduced a, l a lot of our earned revenue. Uh, the marina surpassed our revenue expectations by about 600 and something percent, I think it was. Everybody headed off to sea. Uh, and that has made a, quite a difference to our bottom line. That has helped keep us in the black this year. Uh, and for all our marina guests, we have, in fact, it was just completed. Weems uh, just completed this uh, job, I think about a week or two ago. We have 11 new marina berths that we've invested in, which probably we're hoping over this coming summer will pay for themselves within that one year. So we have a very good number of berths uh, now, and we're putting in new electricity for that in that regard, and new and new water as well to be able to sustain that increased um, those increased uh, docks. But uh, it's 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 who we are. You know, we're a we're a we're a marine we're a maritime museum. So to be able to be able to encourage our guests to to take advantage of the marina capacity, uh, we welcome all. Thank you for asking that, Jim. We're very proud of that huge increase in marina use. Kristen, when you finish the Dove project and that vessel is launched uh, hopefully sometime later this year, what's the next act for the shipyard? Uh, you have obviously a big investment in personnel there. You have some very talented people that have been recruited from all over the country. Uh, what are you gonna do with them and uh, how are you gonna keep them occupied? Yeah, number one, thank you, thank you, Dick. Number one, we don't want to lose them. There's a phenomenal group of people there now. Uh, we have a, uh, we have, it's a very strong program now over the last year or so. We are actively seeking new commissions. If you happen to know anybody who wants to build a jolly big ship, please let us know because we will be there on uh, to pitch our to pitch our skill set to be able to do so. Uh, we have some very good contracts now with other not-for-profits who have, and Solomon's uh, is a great example. They have a uh, skipjack, a buy boat, uh, and uh, we have annual contracts now. And uh, their buy boat, the WB Tennyson, is a, I think it's a nine log buy boat. Those logs will need replacing in another year or so. And guess where they're going to come and get that uh, a new uh, log built by those logs replaced? We are really the only organization, not even just a museum, who knows how to build uh, log boats. 
uh, log canoes. Uh, we have uh, other clients as well that uh, we are restoring wooden boats. And uh, this is, we have plans in our master plan, uh, as Richard mentioned, stage one, which is the expansion and renovation of the current library and uh, collections building. We're adding another 5,000 square feet that starts in the next day or two. Um, and then we're building a new, uh, another new building a little bit later this year, uh, which will incorporate a welcome center, exhibition space, the store, uh, a mini cafe, uh, and then stage three is an expense, which will happen the following year. It's the expansion of the shipyard because this, every not-for-profit has to think about how to uh, expand its earned revenue. You, we cannot rely anymore just on membership or annual fund. Uh, again, expansion of the marina, um, events, weddings, uh, but uh, the shipyard is a very important revenue earning uh, program for us now, and we need to be able to find the work to be able to do so. What we are talking about as well is we are putting together a database of all the other shipyards uh, on the Chesapeake, and we are working to create a job sharing program uh, to keep, be able to keep, if there's not enough work for these phenomenal master shipwrights on our campus, we are working to create the partnerships and relationships with commercial yards or with uh, museum yards, not-for-profit yards, uh, to be able to share our, our expertise, to be able to share our personnel uh, so we don't lose them. Uh, we've, we've created quite a, a unit there, family for want of a better word, uh, and uh, it's very important that we keep them at the, at the museum or keep them employed by the museum, but perhaps working somewhere else. Thank you for that, Dick. This isn't exactly a question, but the outreach of the museum to the community under your leadership has been exceptional. And when you see the upcoming programs that include important history about African Americans in the Chesapeake area, I cannot compliment or you and your staff enough for prioritizing, especially now, yeah. the inclusiveness of the museum to the whole community, to St. Michael's, to Talbot County. We thank you. Betty, thank you. <laughs> Are there further questions for Kristen? I see none. Uh, we've given Rob the rest of the evening off. He's in Ocean City on a delayed honeymoon. So it uh, <laughs> falls to me to thank you all very much for your participation in this session. Thank you, Kristen, for your excellent uh, remarks and your time this evening. Our next session will be the second Tuesday in, uh, or is it the first Tuesday, whatever, uh, in February. And that will be Pickering Creek and Mark Scallion will be the speaker. And we have a club member who will do that introduction. So we hope to see you all uh, next month about the same time. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. And if anyone else would like more information or a private tour, I'm easily contactable. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you at Pickering Creek. Take care, everyone. Stay healthy, please. <laughs>